Janine Chastain, welcome to the Arc Speak podcast. First time on this show, but our paths have crossed many times. And I think the last time we saw you in person was probably San Francisco. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's right. Yep. We were on the expo floor. This nice. is actually uh, such an honor. If you had told me five years ago when I lived in San Francisco and was walking around listening to podcasts on a daily basis that I'd be on the show, I would have been totally shocked. And But it's really encouraging. <laughs> So thank you for having me. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, first question, Janine, why all the punctuation? You got it in the name. You got, you're got you doubling down with the name of your business. Like, just going for it. You're owning the punctuation. Oh, yes. Well, it has followed me my whole life that people have been very confused by my name. It has an apostrophe in it. And so it felt appropriate to acknowledge that front and center and just own it. And I like it. I think it's a way to name my business after myself without actually doing so. That's a, a, a brilliant. I actually love actually, it. I, I was going to say that's fantastic. It's a, and you get a symbol. Like you just get a symbol. Like yeah. that you just get to own as well, right? Like the graphical mark of an apostrophe. I mean, it's 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 all there, like right in front of you for the taking, and you you just took it. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is great to have you here, and you are also. You have a rich pedigree in podcasting, and so you sound amazing. You, you know what you're doing, and and you alluded to the fact that being on the other side of the table is harder. But we're going to do our best to make that as easy as possible. So I appreciate Wait, it. Usually, I'm I'm usually <laughs> asking the questions, so this is a nice challenge for me to, to take on. Nice, nice. Well, catch us up. Let's talk about what you've been working on uh, since we saw you last. I mean, the tides have shifted, as they always do. Uh, things have evolved. And so, like, w tell us where Apostrophe Consulting is and what you're doing with it now, because you are still very much in the architectural realm. And I mean, Apostrophe Consulting always has been, but you've taken a hiatus from podcasting in the architectural realm, right? So give us an idea of, of how, how things have shifted for you over the last... I don't know, four or five months. Thank you for asking. I actually, the last time I recorded a podcast on this mic was in December. So it's been almost four months or so. That was a really tough decision because I love podcasting. I'm very much in love with the medium and the creation. And mm. it, it's very much an artistic expression to be able to go in and talk with people and pull out a story and, and make a really cool podcast episode. But I think... It was really clear to me, actually in San Francisco last year at a convention, that I needed to make a really hard choice between my love for podcasting and what we had created on Practice Disrupted and Apostrophe Consulting. So I went into business about six months before the pandemic, and I had been working on building this business through my MBA when I was still out in Oakland. And so... For the past four and a half years, I've been really invested in trying to get this off the ground, and it has grown. The parallel is when the podcast was taking off, I was, we would record every week, we would have, we were trying to put out about 40 episodes a year, but behind the scenes, I was also trying to like figure out how to put the business together, market myself, offer different services to clients figure out how to put contracts together and sell my work. And so I was getting more and more clients and opportunities. And basically, Evelyn and I had talked about me taking a break at some point. But I think heading into the last season, we talked about it before the season started and just acknowledged that I really needed to put all of my focus here, which was very mm -hmm. tough. Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely miss the show. And I think she's in the spirit of two women who really care about the profession and entrepreneurship, like she is continuing to do the podcast, which I'm very excited about. And I'm she's graciously and kindly accepted that I'm focusing on my business right now. And so I've just been able to shift all of that creative energy back into my own company and trying to, I mean, really ramp up this year 2024 it's going to be my fifth year and i'm really excited i'm trying to just go all in for it so for those who don't know what apostrophe does which they should but if they don't 
Can you kind of give everybody a, a rundown? Yes, absolutely. So we are a business management consulting practice and we work with AEC professionals, primarily architects, because that's what I was trained in. But I went and got my MBA and I've been blending my training in architecture from practice and this really rich education that I got into creating a new type of business management consulting. And it's very much focused through the lens of someone who experienced some of the biggest challenges our industry is facing and a desire to want to design and solve those issues with organizations, with leaders, with teams to come up with pathways forward. So I am... I want to be part of the solution. On Practice Disruptive, we talk a lot about the challenges that the industry is going through. And in our business, we get the opportunity to partner with leaders who really are interested in being part of the solution and leading change. And we work with them to design adjustments in their businesses to help them grow or to help them respond to some of the things that are you know, preventing them to be able to achieve their goals. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the words that come to my mind when you say that is like organizational resiliency, which is like at adaptability plus proactive, right? Like like getting on the, the proactive side rather than the reactive side of constantly putting out fires, which is kind of like Cormac and I talk about this all the time on the podcast, right? Like that's kind of what an architect does, right? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just this constant deadline go, 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 push, push, push. So all of a sudden somebody throws you a curveball, you have to react to it. And, and Mm -hmm. we are, we are as a species of architects really good at like thinking on our feet, right. And, and moving quickly and pivoting and, and, and adapting. But, but to your point about like the organizations, in my view, organizations are not good at adapting traditionally, like, and, and just generally because, because we've, we've, we have this rich history. We architecture's been around forever. It's very slow to change. I mean, it, it didn't change for so long. And now technology is coming and beating on the door of every firm out there and every person. Like that's a, a thing that I notice a lot as on more on the technology side is like the the tech companies have they used to go through the IT department. They used to go through the leadership of the firm. Now they're going to everyone's inbox. They're going to everybody's social media feed and they're they're pushing for, you know, you to adopt their stuff on a person to person basis, which makes it, I think, even more difficult for the organization to keep up with what's now they're getting bombarded from all angles, including their staff. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and it, that's just one tier of it. Right. Then there then there's all of the other stuff that that's going on in the practice and with equity and with potentially unionizing like depending on which firms you in, you're in and where and then we've got the environmental challenges and like there's just all of this stuff and 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 then there's our clients right so right. W- when i think about kind of like this organizational readiness or resiliency i mean i would love to hear what you're really doing in that because there are firms i think who are proactively seeking that and then uh, there still are is a huge number who are just kind of watching from the sidelines or hoping they never have to do that or doing whatever they can to avoid doing that, right? Those are all kind of different versions of, of a similar um, point of view. So like, wh- who are, who are you been working, who have you been working with? And I'm, I'm not necessarily looking for names, but I'm looking for qualities and the things that you're seeing there. Mm-hmm. Well, I, there's so many things to talk about within what you just said. I, I will start by saying that I think the thesis of our podcast was always that the industry was really slow to change. And it caught up with our industry once the pandemic hit, it accelerated the need for change. And I think many firm leaders are trying to continue to find their way through that on uh, the flip side of the pandemic, where we're trying to decide where are we going next with the way that our organizations are evolving. And there is a lot of external pressure and from our staff to consider all these variables that previously you kind of could optionally choose to participate in or not. And some firms still do. But I think there's more and more pressure to start discussing those or to make changes in those directions. And so I often find that architects are a little like 
confused because they're they're trying to lead on their projects. That's what they've always prioritized in their work, uh, their work with their clients. And now there's all these additional things that they're trying to think through and how to lead it quickly enough to respond to the um, demand for change. So what we've been able to do is work with different leaders who have a tolerance for change or they're interested in looking at practice in new ways. And one of the examples I'll mention is a firm based out of Oakland that had a very much startup culture when we started working with them. They were working with redesigning kind of the studio model so that the organization worked differently than the traditional. And and someone once asked me, they were like, what do you mean by traditional? <laughs> it, it just means kind of the how it's always been, the the model that we inherited but have maybe not questioned or challenged and in this Mm -hmm. example rather than a hierarchical structure that really pushes back to one leader this firm owner was trying to redesign the studio to create a little bit more like structures within that that allowed for smaller studio environments where people could be successful and have relationships within the studio to boost their productivity so didn't always like have to get bottlenecked back to the top. And so we came in and we started working with them really through the lens of training and supporting their staff on communications and mentorship and how to build up that quality of studio culture that promotes learning and collaboration and helping a lot of these, I would say, next generation leaders to grow into their roles and to get the support that they were looking for that's often lacking in the studio environment. Can you talk about what some of those like lacking things are? And I'll just, I'll start so that, cause I think that could be just so open-ended that yes. who knows where that would go. <laughs> but but the, the idea that there's, there, how many times have you heard, um, or, and I'm, and I'm th- this is the we the, of the professionals, it's like, what do I need to do to get to the next level? Yeah. And the answer is, well, just keep doing what you're doing. And it's so ambiguous. Yeah. It's like, well, mm-hmm. if I'm doing what, if I'm already doing what I'm doing, then why, am I at the then why do I need to keep doing that to get to that yeah. next position, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you kind of hear the absurdity in the answer, but that's the answer. And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, I guess I should, not, like, maybe that was a dumb question. I don't even know. But but there isn't a lot of structure around this and it, and it has i think it has a lot to do with intuition with on the leader's standpoint but i don't think that they're good at kind of communicating measurable goals or or metrics for someone to achieve to get somewhere and there's this kind of you know mentor mentee apprenticeship kind of model even though we don't call it that that's always floating around and it's like that, and that's where that intuition comes in. It's like, I'll know when you're ready and you're not ready yet. And mm-hmm. and you have to do it the way that I did it, potentially. Yeah. Uh, you have to suffer the things that I suffered. You have, to, you have to clear the hurdles that I cleared. And I haven't thrown all those hurdles at you yet. So I don't, right? And so these are, these are things that, that have, I, I've obsessed over. It, it, just kind of working with, as a psychiatrist in the, in the office when I'm coaching younger people as, as we're, as we just go through, go through time together, go through projects together. Uh, and Cormac, I know, I know you have, well, you, were, you want to add. No, you were, question. well, you were, you literally just summarized and maybe Janine, you um, caught on to it. It's like, he, he was summarizing that traditional office environment yeah. that, you know, so many, and, and I, I see it in, in our firm, I see it in, in other firms are the the younger staff are so reluctant to they're frustrated by being able to kind of like break into that kind of traditional mindset. So like, well, why do I have to keep working this way? Why do I have to do this? Why can't mm-hmm. we change? Why can't we evolve? And and that's where you come in, is it's like there are better ways to do architecture than the way we've always been doing it. We Evan and I have kind of always constantly keep talking about the bad habits that we learned that were taught to us from the previous generation and the previous generation. And now we're getting to a point where we see younger staff, all these emerging professionals who are questioning us on it. And we have to stop and say, well, wait, they're right. Why are we continuing to do the same thing? Business as usual. Mm hmm. Yeah, man. I And I want to acknowledge, I mean, so I am like, I should be an architect right now, but I'm not. 
And there's a complaint in our field right now in offices of a shortage going on. Mm. Like, mm. I think you can go to any office and say, we're having a hard time hiring people. Uh, we're, we are shorted on staff and we uh, need people to staff these jobs. And then in addition to that, some of what you're talking about, which is, and then the staff that we do have, they seem really eager. They want to be promoted or they want to move up. And I just want to frame what's going on and name it so that we can give some context for why this is happening. So my generation graduated into the worst economic downturn. And when we came out of school, we couldn't get jobs in this field. There was just no way to get into a firm at an entry level position. So we are behind in our careers. The ones that are still there that are in that middle management position, they had to fight really hard to stay in this profession. They either, a lot of them went out of the country to work. Some of them took underpaid internships. There's a lot of stories there. And we lost a lot of people at that point. Yeah. And then for the ones who stayed, at some point they made a choice or are even now contemplating that choice of do I stay or do I go? But when you have that delay, it has caused economic ins um, insecurity for our generation, which is very real. Yeah. Like I don't, I hope people listening won't dismiss this, it's very real. To lose income for several years, to be behind in promotions, and then to enter practice and feel some of the pain points that have happened. I mean, when I finally got into an architecture position, I started experiencing all of these strange things that I didn't know how to deal with. One being like late paychecks or mismanagement, or when I did get laid off um, early on, I was on the East Coast and couldn't get a job here. So I went to the West Coast and then like a year later, the recession caught up out there and then both my husband and I got laid off in our firms. So, and then when we were trying to find jobs, you know, we applied to so many positions. Like, I feel like I sent out like 50 to 60 resumes and never heard back from firms. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, like he took a job, he had an MRC and he got a job at The Gap. That was right out of his master's degree program for a little bit. Perfect to, fit. Yeah, perfect yeah. Fit right there. Yeah. Exactly, naturally. <laughs> so I guess I just want to contextualize this, that mm -hmm. when we complain about this, and I heard this in one of your other interviews, you guys were talking about the recession and how it's impacted other generations. Um, but for this missing middle, uh, that was a really big um, reason why that's happening right now. And, and I'll say that the profession in general is hurting badly because of your missing generation. Because exactly. we're, there's like, let's say senior staff who should be either moving out or moving out that there's nobody to take their place. And mm -hmm. there's people who should be firm leaders that aren't there because they were never there. And mm -hmm. in it, it is in, I don't know necessarily in, and I can say this from experience, from conversation with friends that are in all sorts of different firms throughout the country that they don't like the staff that we had when we were young aren't there. Like the same kind of experience isn't there anymore because they were just right. never there. And, and and we haven't really recouped from that. The, the The profession really hasn't recouped from that. So now we're putting the onus on even younger staff to be Right. To accelerate and to be, you should be more experienced a lot quicker. And you're like, but where do I get that experience from? Because they're not. Chat GPT. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So now I want to go to the next layer of explaining what's going on in relationship to what your original question was, which is this gap around knowledge and this missing middle. So by missing this generation, there's, there's another thing going on where different generations have learned in different ways. So in working with firms, we've been able to verify there, some of the generations that are in leadership positions learn by doing because they were thrown in the deep end and that is how they experienced the profession. So that is a way that they perceive. That was us. 
yeah. training. <laughs> that, that is a big way how we learn. Yeah. 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 And I have so much respect for that because I think that's an important skill in in moving forward in this profession. But a lot of the younger generations are more oriented towards what you could describe as like classroom style teaching. Like they came up in more uh, being presented information and having a chance to study it or learn or ask questions. And they, they, especially I think millennials and I think Gen Z, I don't totally want to generalize, but I think that they appreciate when they have information presented in a way that they can kind of look at it and kind of figure it out and go through the process. Like if they had to draw a detail, having some kind of orientation point on, well, what steps do I take when I don't know the answer <laughs> on how to draw this detail? Um, so I think it's just about a different perception of learning. And without some of those people in the middle to help transfer knowledge back, we have like a um, an issue with knowledge transfer as a whole. Yeah. And, there, and people are so busy that people like Cormac in, in your position, you don't have time to mentor or teach at that detailed level. Like you're lucky if you can get all of the fires out that you're working on in a given week, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a- <laughs> exactly. So it's a big ask on senior leaders to ask them to pause and to take the time to, um, you know, help this generation catch up. And I think that a lot of firms are grappling with that. How do we make better learning systems to help uh, this group, this next generation that's coming forward, catch up and fill the roles and the responsibilities that we need in the firm? And, uh, you know, we have most firms have so much work right now and they're just trying to get it done. They're trying to or if they're in a part of the country that's uh, experiencing kind of a market retraction, they're desperately trying to win new work right now to right, keep right, yeah keep the revenue coming in. So for me, as someone who thinks about designing the business, like to me, it's about all of these like really interesting design variables that that's what we're designing around. How do we create the business structure to support firm leaders, to support the next generation, to create organizations that are healthy enough to navigate, move through these difficult moments and then grow, grow exponentially and help I mean, my my biggest vision is how do we design these organizations so that they not only grow, but lead the profession forward in new directions? I think of the students when we're having this conversation and and on some level, maybe they're just glazing over because um, it, it isn't interesting. We're not talking about design. We're not talking about interesting architectural challenges. But in your work, going from working in the profession to working on the profession, which is how I kind of characterize that, right, is this idea of organizations have to get this get this shit figured out. Yeah. And students think they have it figured out. And I think there's a lot of students listening to this, and they're like, red flags are just going up. <laughs> Right, yeah. because there are a lot of architectural businesses out there that don't have their shit figured out, and they're they're either avoiding it, like I said earlier, or they are they are really trying hard to do this in addition to doing all of the other stuff that they have to do to keep the revenue coming in, right? And and to be in a place where a firm is large enough to be able to dedicate resources to figuring this stuff out, that's great. And they probably are empowered to do that because those firms, they, get, they have the resources so they can do it. But there's a lot of medium and small size firms mm-hmm. that are just trying to keep the lights on, just trying to keep, just trying to maintain, right? Absolutely. Maintain where they are. And it is it is a tough business. And, it, and it, we are starting to go through a retraction and we're getting pushed on the technology side where where very small tasks are being taken away mm-hmm. by technology or just replaced by technology. Maybe taken away is not the right word because I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity to do better things than to do the menial tasks that technology could hopefully take away. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but there is a lot of moving parts in this machine happening right now. I think it's scary for everyone. It's just like there's a lot going on all over the place. And... And I mean, you, you said so many things in there that I think are just ticking my experience boxes off too. And the things you were talking about with Cormac, having to deal with 
like actually delivering the project and trying to figure out how to educate people for the education that they didn't get in school because they can't get it there mm-hmm. and learning new firm standards right. and learning the technology the way the firm wants them to learn it and deliver like there's just and 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 or 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 you know i've i've dealt with these are some people's first jobs period mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. just learning how to be an employee just learning how to like work with other people learning how to like rather than sitting back and kind of like disengaging getting involved in kind of taking direction of their own how to sh- how to like sail their own ship of the profession and try to figure mm-hmm. out how to do all of those things as well as what does it mean to be an architect what do i need to know what are the what are the things that are beyond just design beyond just putting to get together a set of documents there there is so much more in one of the things that you're outlining is is the the need to understand business and the need to understand how how everything beyond the the set of documents really works because that honestly is far more what the architecture profession is about than the 10% that we spend in actually doing design work or doing documentation it's all of the other things to keep the lights on to, to keep projects rolling in um investing in our own future. Yeah. And I just want to acknowledge, so just for the listeners, what we do, we work on uh, business strategy is probably the biggest bucket of what we do. Um, but we, it's very much centered around the people culture part. And I call it change leadership. Some people call it change management, but it's this idea of adaptability. And um, I think we're working with firms of all sizes. And one of the things that's cool about uh, the practice that I didn't expect was everyone kept saying, well, you'll want to niche and pick firm firm size that you want to work with. We've been able to work with firms of all sizes. I have a startup in Memphis that she's a solopreneur that built a team of four around her. And I'm working with her all the way up to a firm that has, um, you know, over 1,200 people. So, we work at all scales and what's interesting is each firm has its own unique culture so when we come in we're learning about what are the struggles that they perceive in their organization and then when we come in and we do our own um, assessment we're able to kind of look for these different design problems and design towards different solutions so uh, for my client in memphis it's about revenue and becoming a leader and an owner at that scale and what does it look like at that scale Uh, for my larger firms it might be about the talent development piece and in one case one of my current clients we're working on an entire project management training program that helps people get into the soft skills around like Cormac you brought up that they need to develop those skills that support the architecture. Like, for example, how to have a difficult conversation, how to go uh, talk to somebody <laughs> on your job site. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when things are going wrong, how to handle those things. Um, that's a huge so challenge. <laughs> these are all the things that we don't learn in school, doesn't right. get tested. You learn through mentorship or observing somebody. Um, yeah. They're always uncomfortable. But... We're doing a lot with teams to start having more of those conversations because next generation next generation leaders need they need guidance yeah. on how to handle that because those are the moments that count. Those are the things that escalate your cost or your change orders or um, something getting built wrong, your liability. Like oh, yeah. that yeah. is it, it's so important. Um, but it's been really fun because like by approaching it like a design problem, we've been able to learn about all these different elements of practice that now I feel so much more informed about how to practice architecture. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. You you mentioned like at attacking it as a design problem. And I think that is that is exactly how I have framed it myself going from working in on projects, which are design problems, to working on the profession or as your to your company as a design problem. Like we're so we as in architects are so focused on solving our clients' design problems, mm-hmm. we rarely 
look in the mirror, right? right? Yeah. And, and look at ourselves or our organization or our teams. It happens, of course, but but just to like really step back and assess the situation and ask why. Why do we do it like this? Do we need to continue to do it like this? What do we need to start doing? What do we need to stop doing to make room for the things we need to start doing? And what are the things we need to keep doing? Like it's it's like these three columns are actually pretty easy to start to put things into when you when everybody has a voice to actually be able to do that. And I think you know, you talk about the new generations like needing guidance. And I think one of the things that I've been so impressed with, and this has been, it's come up a couple times on other podcasts too, where it's like, there's no, there's no problem asking questions like this generation coming into the field expects that you will take their questions. Right. (laughs) And, and that may be frustrating for some of the older generations where it's like, I got so much work to do. I can't just be fielding questions all the time. But at the same time, what would you rather have? Would you rather have them, not asking you how to do it and then mm-hmm. just going onto YouTube and trying to do it probably the wrong way and delivering that to you as the result. And it's like, well, you, you garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Right. So like, like the, I, I hate to say it, but like the, the firms are, and they kind of always have been the boot camp. Like this is the proving grounds where people learn how to become an architect. School is not that we can't keep saying, how come you didn't learn that in school? Like it, because it just, there's, there's not room for everything in school. Right. And so I don't know, I'm rambling at this point, no, but there's but, a lot of things in there that I think you, you touched on that really like brought a lot of these things up to the surface. Yeah. You, I mean, and, and we've talked about this in the past, but I mean, it's this investment that firms need to make in their future. And one of those things, you know, that, that big investment is you started you started talking about like you know how are you know like documents put together how does that kind of like play into say your deliverable your contract documents it's just part of all of these things but it's liability factors and all of these other things and just understand being able to maybe not throw them into the pressure cooker immediately but start to explain to them the simple things about it's just like okay if you're putting a line here that line really means something And it could be something that could be a problem solver, or it could create some kind of massive change order and things like Mm -hmm. that. And just being conscious of those things and and understanding like the implications of, of like, you know, the work that you do, but then just start to like integrate them into the understanding of like all the different knowledge that it takes to like, to, to, to work with them. I mean, prior to joining the firm that I'm at now, where I had a lot more opportunity to do a lot of CA and take a lot of our interns out, out onto the field. And so like, you could actually like say, here's the set of drawings and here's what it, that means. And then I like, point to what this line means and that line means and all that other stuff. And, and one of the interesting things and comments that I used to always get back is I didn't realize how much management was in architecture. Right. And, and again, as, as, as Evan was saying is that's where the boot camp is. It's like, that's where that, that, that missing link of the of the knowledge sharing is that firms need to kind of address is because you now I always get this just like I know I'm asking a lot of questions but I just and, and I'm like whoa 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 don't you don't have to you don't have to apologize for asking questions in fact I prefer you to ask questions I want you to ask questions because one it means that you're conscious of what you do and don't know and you're really conscious of wanting to do it right and I would, it would much rather be done right than to just sit there quietly, say that you know what I'm asking you to do or what the project is demanding you to do, and then you don't do it right. Or you do go to Google, as Evan was saying. And and I think that it, it's interesting that you're getting in there to, to shape the kind of the, the business kind of like plan of all of these. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that you know, and, and I'm sure you probably do talk about this with, with firms that you work for is like, you know, don't just think of mentoring as top down, but also, you know, bottom up, you know, because mm-hmm. a lot of the change that we're like the leadership is going to be forced to make is to address the lack of information sharing, the lack of, you know, um, just communication and mentorship that the younger staff is. And so, all of these questions are, are 
in in my opinion, more demands from the younger generation of, I need to know what I'm doing. You got to help me out here. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, you want you want to know that when you're paying them that they're doing the work um, because if they're not doing the work. You guys are going to be um, suffering oh, later yeah, in yeah, the project. Yeah. But I, I think uh, one of the proudest moments was early on when I started the business. Someone referred me to Kieran Timberlake, and mm. I got to go to their studio. This was right as the pandemic hit. So like, I'm like the la the like day that the world shut down, I'm like <laughs> standing in their office and I was helping them with a mentorship program and they wanted to understand how to build a mentorship program within their firm that they had started designing one and they had a really good framework and they just, they were curious because they're very iterative thinkers. How can we make it better? What other things are going on in other firms that we don't know about? What could we apply here that would enhance this? And it just got me into, I mean, I had always been involved in mentorship programs dating back to when I was involved with AIA and AIAS, but this pulled me into thinking about it from the, um, workplace environment standpoint and allowed me to do all of this research into the industry around this topic. And I think my conclusion was that because we come from the apprenticeship model, I think there's a, there needs to be an evolution of how we're thinking about mentorship, that it's no longer just that one way direction. It needs to be a two way dialogue. It's really important and if you can build community around it, that's even more important. And variety and allowing people to just talk to different people in the studio. Because you might need help on code one day and that's somebody else that's not your mentor. Or And you need to be able to be comfortable enough to go ask that person for help or a question. Um, I just think that building more accessible dialogue within the studio environment to create those learning opportunities is so essential. I've heard of uh, the youngest of the you know interns coming into the office, and we'll do. And I'm sure this is this is. You, we, there's probably counter examples to this, but but the the thing that I heard was like they'll do anything to not ask a question. It was like I will look it up five different ways before I actually need to talk to a person. Why is that? I mean, I think that's the actual question, right? It's not like why do they do it? Why don't they just engage with the person? Well. Who is the right person? Have you, do they have the connections to the people who know what they need to know when they need to know it? And, and it becomes more of a proactive thing again, like a strategy to engage with the younger generations mm -hmm. who do have a shorter attention span, are digitally native, are, have no problem looking things up and, and trying to find information out for themselves, whether it's right or not, right? Like that, mm -hmm. those are all good qualities actually, but they're not matching up with your expectation of, of, but what are you doing about it, right? And so I'm, I'm curious what the firms that you're working for, are these practices that you're trying, that you're putting into place? And because I think a lot of times, like they just, firms just don't know what to do or how to approach yeah. that. I mean, again, this is a generational conversation and I think, uh, you as a leader, okay, so I, a lot of my work is grounded in developing leaders, developing leadership skills. And I think in this instance, what we're talking about is firm management and leadership for the organization and people. And that requires awareness that not everyone is going to perceive me coming to you and asking you a question as a positive. They might mm -hmm. feel like that's showing weakness mm -hmm. or that they don't know how to do their job. And that could be um, a negative against them when it comes time for an annual review, which would mean that they don't get a salary bump. You know, like there's all kinds of things that people come up with in their heads that they don't tell you. And you and or maybe they think that your expectation is that you're supposed to go research it five times, five different ways before they right. ask you. Totally. Like, so you as the leader have to build a culture in your environment that sets the expectation for how you want your team to communicate and ask questions and engage to get the solutions. And uh, that is you know, half the battle. And then there's like building comfort and trust in those relationships to make those conversations successful. Like I remember the code guy was like the gruff guy over in the corner who seemed grumpy. Like I didn't want to go talk to him. <laughs> always. I mean, not always, but, but maybe. yeah, like it's a good, it's a good characterization, right? I, 
I, I, those were like also the best people to talk to sometimes, right? Oh like yeah, they're, like they're, when they're you realize like that amazing. they're really like I don't know, they're really teddy bears actually. <laughs> They were Cormac's, they were grumpy. Cormac's adjusting they, his shirt, right? Well, now. they were grumpy because nobody listened to him. It's just like, right. you know, your building's not going to work. Go ahead, keep doing it. You, your building's not going to work. Right. It, yeah. You're not going to get a permit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what's interesting about that though is so, um, I've been challenging our leadership, or at least project management leadership, um, in our firm when. People start complaining about it. It's just like, oh, you know, this person's not getting it or they're working really slow or I asked them to do something and they did something completely different and it wasn't what I was expecting. And I asked, then I, I challenged them. I'm like, okay, so tell me, like, what is their level of experience? Well, they're, they're new. It's like, so why would you expect them to understand or know what you're asking them to do? Like, did you, mm -hmm. did you show them? what they needed to do or at least instruct them on where to go about doing what it is that they need to do like no i don't have time to do that they can figure it out themselves like and this is your problem it was like the right, you're not it was communicating like, i was like the problem isn't them the problem is you the problem is the leadership you know <laughs> like unfortunately push push this is the problem that we're having here is like you know you're you're and this is kind of i i, I put it in in the perspective of the few people that I've talked to within my firm, but this is a profession wide issue is it's just like, well, I, I expect more out of them. Well, you can mm -hmm. only expect what you like, if they don't have the experience, where else are they going to get the experience, but from you. And if you are not willing, to, I think that go ahead. that's there, that problem is way bigger than oh, that, yeah. right? It's like, what are you doing about yes. it? Uh, yeah. Nothing. Well, they're going to go somewhere else. Yes. And right. try to get the answer, oh, yeah. and it might be the same story over there too, right? And then, and then it's like, how many times does that happen before they're like, "Screw exactly. this, I'm, I'm, I'm out." Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean that that was kind of what I experienced. Yeah. Like, I felt like I just, I, I, when I started practicing, I just was like, "Okay, so what? I, what do you want me to do? Like, how do I move forward? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I, I want to contribute, but you're not." giving me any orientation yeah. of like what the target is, what the goal is, how to prioritize what I'm doing, how should I come, you know, it's just, and it's hard when you're like starting out in school. And I think as you mature and you learn to start to hold ground and have those conversations, but like you just don't know that stuff coming out of school. Yeah. You have to get over yeah. the hurdle. But a lot of the work that we're doing, I think it helps with firm retention and creating more career development inside of firms for people to advance and feel like they're supported. Like I remember actually several of our clients have said that because they've done these different programs, like either leadership or communication, they felt closer to their colleagues, they felt supported, and they felt like they um, got a lot out of the experience. So that was motivation to continue to like, mm stay with the firm to continue working on the project. And a lot of the people I've been privileged to work with have advanced into leadership roles. Um, those are some of the most rewarding projects that I get to work on is helping someone who decides that they want to go for something and they do, and just trying to help them figure out how to get there. It's interesting to think about how there's a storytelling aspect within these firms to build a culture of I don't know. I'm using these words a little bit out of context, but it's like building morale, right? It's like, it's, it's, there's this so much emphasis put on the outward expression of right. the stories that firms tell to win projects, to build relationships with clients, right? And it's all about winning work. But there's this inner story that also needs to be told in many different layers, which is like, it's great to work here for a long time. And here are the reasons, here's expressions of that. And you can point at people and say, look how fulfilled they are. Look at what where they've come from and where they've gone. And I think that gets ignored in firms a lot. At least that's my experience where it's just like, no, you'd pay your dues. Like you make it, you, you just do your time and you work your way up. And it's not like that anymore, mm -hmm. right? And, and we've seen this shift happen Architects need to be good storytellers outside, but they also need to be good storytellers inside. We recently recorded an, an episode about internships, 
and like what a quality internship is and how the goal at the firm that I was at was to create a story for them to go back and tell their their schoolmates, their, mm-hmm. their colleagues at school and their professors to shift the perception of the firm in those circles, right? Mm-hmm. And and how do you do that? Like you you do it. You do it well. You exceed you exceed their expectations of what an internship is and then they go talk about their experience, which is the word you used, right? To start to tell that story and it takes time, right? Mm-hmm. But that has to happen inside our firms too. Like once somebody's there, it's not like you're just lucky you have a job. I'll see you on Monday, yeah. right? It, it's like we're building something together over time and we want to do kick-ass work. How do we do that? Like people who want to come to work and do their best. I think That's right. people start there, but how do you keep that going? And so I'm, I'm curious from your, like the interventions that you're, you're participating in here with your consulting group, like what your consulting that you're doing, right? It's like, is there a storytelling and marketing and communications, not just outwardly, but also inwardly, to like to like just just tell people like this is important and here's why it could work out in your favor if you participate in these kinds of things. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously with my background in podcasting and actually when I was you know, laid off from architecture, I got into marketing for firms. So I did marketing for like three different firms in the Bay Area. So I have a deep love of marketing and communications that has come into my own practice. So we were telling these podcast story episodes about all these amazing firms. And through the process of building apostrophe, I feel like I've been helping these firms daylight their internal culture, have dialogue around it, have discussion. And I do think that firms are starting to market their culture more in in terms of external marketing. But even just internally, like taking a studio from uh, an environment where the studio is quiet and they're not communicating to having um i don't know if you just saw that but my like yeah. ai popped up <laughs> my <laughs> thumbs up <laughs> yay ai um uh I, I lost my train of thought so c- transitioning it from an environment like a studio environment that's quiet to um one where they're starting to have more internal dialogue about the culture and the environment and supporting each other is so powerful and you're right evan people who feel engaged in their work do better in their work. They draw better. They feel more committed. And I find like a couple of those really important intervention points are discussing what happens when things go wrong. Discussing yeah. like people leave because they get burnt out on getting slammed on the job day after day, having to put out fires, not understanding if management's taking care of them or has their best interest at heart. And taking time to actually have conversations internally around difficult conversations, how to handle hard moments, why management's making certain decisions, um, the constraints that leaders are up against build so much more trust in the relationship with these communities, these environments, these cultures that we're trying to operate within. There are a lot of pressures. This is a very difficult profession to learn and to improve at, but the more that we can lift the communication inside the studio, the better return you get, I think, in the quality of the work and what you're trying to do, whatever impact you're trying to make. I feel like there's this uh, weird hesitation around moving people up the ladder. I'm using my podcasting air quotes there quickly. It's like there's this expectation that's just kind of built in that this is gonna be a slow process, it takes time. And that's definitely been the case before, but we've never had the tools we have now. We don't, we've never had the expectations that we have now about people who want to move up quickly. Why? Because architecture pays crappy salaries Mm -hmm. when you graduate. It's like, of course people want to move up quickly. And why aren't we doing every single thing we can to help get them there as fast as possible? The company benefits from that too. The higher, the more I pay you, the higher I can bill you out. Like that is just an easy equation to understand, right? And and so I don't really understand why why things still work like that. 
and and again i see the frustration of the younger generations and and even the older generations who just like got looked over so many times their position they haven't they're not an associate yet they're not a senior associate they're not a principal they've been stuck in the overlooked by because oh we can only promote this many people mm-hmm. and there's yeah. there's these weird politics that get brought into it over mm-hmm. and, and and it just makes everything really murky and, and muddy and and Again, I think it, it stems from like, okay, no, look, we're busy. And I think busy is kind of a disease, right? <laughs> it's like, it, it's not, it's, we're too you busy don't need to be busy. To you don't attention. need to be yeah. <laughs> too, too busy to pay attention, too busy to invest in yeah. your people. Like that is a sorry excuse, yeah. right? And, and I think, uh, you know, I, we definitely see examples of, of both sides of that. Like to your point, you, you're pointing out some really great examples of what's possible. And I hope that that's inspirational for people who listen because that it is possible. Like it totally is possible, but you have to be intentional about it and you have to be proactive about it, not just reacting to the day-to-day busyness of, I, I don't have time for this kind of stuff. So when I was working on my MBA and I was still really heavily involved in AIA, I... I focused on my like basically like my let's call it a thesis. It's not really a thesis. It was like a capstone project, uh, designing, helping. I was working on a committee called the Center for Civic Leadership, and we designed an entire leadership institute for the AIA mm-hmm. to bring as many people of any generation into leadership development training as possible because we saw this you know, limit on accessibility towards leadership development training that was only for the C-suite. You had to have a lot of money to pay for it. You had to fly out um, or be appointed by your leadership. And our committee felt like leadership development was sorely needed in our profession. We have, we have such a need for architects to be leaders in our communities and in our firms. And we need to develop as many leaders as we can. So I don't, I, I guess going through that process of building that program, which was successful for five years and had 2,500 people go through it, mm-hmm. is that everyone can be a leader in their firm. It just, they have to look at what the role is within, it's not just about this title. Like we get really fixated on this title because it has to do with salary and it has to do promotion, it has to do with power. But in reality, everyone has a choice to be a leader in their firm, and you can choose to do that on your project as a really kick-ass project manager or architect. You can choose in those moments like how to lead your team as a leader. And if we had the mentality that leadership doesn't have to be the scarcity thing that is only at the top of our firms, that if everyone could act and think like we all have the responsibility to lead in our roles, our profession would be so much better off because we would be leading with the goal of making an impact and really leading our profession forward holistically. I just think that we get really fixated on the financial piece because it is a difficult part to solve around in our industry as a whole and people Like I said, they're struggling. They need that economic certainty in their life that they're going to have a salary increase at the end of the year. Um, That's very real. But I think also separating that because leadership is a mindset. It's not and it's not a title. It's a privilege. And it's everybody's responsibility to kind of, I, I guess, grow forward in their career to lead I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a privilege and it's also a burden. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that that I really learned studying leadership was just like once you take that responsibility, now you are responsible for what happens, right? And and I think there's different levels of that, but but at the highest levels, like being a leader is difficult. It is very difficult and it's it's probably more difficult than people think. I think a lot of people look at a leader and they're like, well, they get all the attention. They get all the the kudos, the glory, but they also get the really hard, they get the hardest stuff too. Mm -hmm. And you may only be seeing the positive sides of of leadership, but leadership also has like an incredible burden to it. And and there's a great book, trying to remember the author, Max... It's called the Art of Leadership. The book. I'll, I'll put it in the sh- in the show notes um, if I can remember <laughs> to do that. But um, 
fantastic book that really talks about all of the qualities that you just mentioned. And, and, and I agree, leadership is a skill that can be learned, right? And, and there is, there's not a lack of leadership. There's just not enough leadership and at mm-hmm. all different levels. And, and I think that's because of, and Cormac and I have talked about this too. It's like there's there, especially with the younger generations, there is a huge fear of failure and that failure being on display and leaders fail on display, right? Like you, you see it, people have to apologize publicly. It's super hard, right? Like, but it happens. And when they do it, I mean, it makes them stronger to go through mm-hmm. those failures and that that's where learning really, it truly happens. So there's a, there's a lot to be, a lot to be said about leadership. I think we've touched on it a lot over the years, but the art of leadership, look up that book. It's a very small book. It's a very easy read. And it is, it is a, a fantastic resource. Mm-hmm. And I have, I have so much more, having had the privilege to work with so many firm leaders across the country, I have so much more appreciation for the, the burden that leaders have to carry as firm owners um, towards risk and towards leadership and leading their firms, and especially the financial piece. Like until mm-hmm. you carry that, uh, to know what that feels like, it is a heavy burden. And there are a lot of tough nights that these leaders probably have a hard time sleeping. So um, it is, it's, I think that it's something that um, we don't talk enough about in our industry and that by having more conversations about the realities of what it means to lead a firm and to carry the salaries of a staff or to uh, win enough work to keep your firm operational. These are all Mm -hmm. really important conversations that are valuable. I I love how you reframed it around like the scarcity versus, you know, abundance mindset. Right. And, and we do, I think at generally speaking as, as a profession tend to relate to a lot of these things in the scarcity mindset. I mean, Cormac and I had another conversation where this came up very recently and, and the, the idea of flipping that story so that it really is like, like you will be better off when you think about these things as if they are just available and everywhere. And it is an investment to make into these things because it creates abundance around you in Mm -hmm. your operation, in your people, in their satisfaction and their happiness and the, in the morale at at work. And so um, I think flipping that mentally is where that begins. Like you have to practice that and it's like it's like this stat I heard about depression. It's like depression is really bad, and it's it's even worse when that's all you can think about, right? And that's when you go down the downward spiral, right? It's because you're just constantly thinking about and churning over, and and you're you get stuck thinking about that. And so, what do you need to do? You need to go out. You need to exercise. You need to go outside. You need a different environment. And I feel like with with leadership with you know, development through professionally uh, in your career, like all of these things, they're right there, right? People just have to be willing to like first shift the mindset and then start acting like, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. And th- and it does kind of spill out then and become a really positive force in the profession. Yeah. Well, what have we missed here, <laughs> Janine? You, you've... You've got an amazing new consulting business, new as in starting on your fifth year. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you celebrated your four-year anniversary. You're, you're in year five. You're working with some amazing clients. We want to help you get the word out. So we'll put links to apostrophe.consulting, which is a great domain name in the, in the, <laughs> I also uh, the show, the show notes. apostrophe.design, which I'm really proud of. <laughs> Apostrophe yes. dot design. Nice. <laughs> One day. <laughs> and you have like this huge passion for architects and for architecture and for the profession. You've done a ton of work with AIA, AIAS, Practice Disrupted. Now you're you're doing this uh, solopreneur and you've, I mean, you have a small team and, and you're doing amazing work and, and everybody deserves to know more about what you're doing and and uh, give you a ring and, and learn more and, and, and make this profession better. But thank you so much for for taking the yeah. time to have a conversation with us today. Yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. I really sincerely appreciate it.